When I was in high school, the only show I ever did was Fiddler on the Roof. And even that was sort of an anomaly, this was very unexpected. But I played Muddle the Taylor. And when I was, actually when I was nine, my mother was going to the Julia Junior College. And she was cast as Yenta in a production of Fiddler, but she didn't have anybody to watch us, watch me. So she had them write two little boys into the show so that at the very end of the play we would walk on stage. Not in the play at all. That was my only exposure to theater when I was a kid, really, and I had this <laughs> walk on. But I, I was like, oh, this is interesting. But anyway, Fiddler got stuck in my head. And then I, when I, my high school was doing it, I was like, oh, I know that show. It's the only show I know. I'll, I'll go out for that. So I did. And I got it in Fiddler. I did the model. Then when I went to audition for Disney, the only song I knew was Miracle of Miracles, Strip from the Roof, because it's the only show I'd ever done. And I sang that in bare feet and street clothes because I didn't know any better. And I pulled the choreographer out from behind the table because I didn't know you weren't supposed to do that. And I danced around the floor with her and sang the song. And I think they gave me that job because they just wanted to see how that was going to play out. Mm. Obviously deferred going to college. And, you know, what, what, what solidified that decision? Was it really the you attempting to identify who you were? I mean, yeah. especially in the face of what your parents might have thought. It was actually, a, when I'm looking back, I felt like in many ways it was a cop-out and I felt like a failure at the time. Mm -hmm. But the truth is, it was really an act of courage. It was the first time in my life I think I really didn't do what was expected of me and I, I took a chance on knowing that this would have been a shitload of money spent towards educating me towards something I didn't even know if I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I had no direction at all. So me choosing myself or to extricate myself from the environment that I was in and to go be around like-minded people, um, I had never been around a healthy gay subculture ever. And I was sort of shocked to see when I got that job at Disney and went out uh, to California for the summer, that no one gave a shit. You know, they, they liked me for who I was, and they thought, well, it was a raw talent, but it was talent, but they really were not concerned with judging me in any way, and I felt like I fit in somewhere for the first time. I felt like I was part of something bigger than me. I had a community. And I think I secretly knew that that's what I was seeking. Now, where did, where did you head off from, from Disney? I took my very first equity audition for Pittsburgh Civic Light Opera. I was like, hey, I'll pull out this old chestnut for my up-tempo, Miracle of Miracles, blah, 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 they got the job. And then I left Florida. I mean, I was at, at Disney for a couple of years, and I went to Tokyo for six months. And then I came back, and they wanted me to stay on as a choreographer in the park. And I was 21 and had no idea for what I was going to do with my life, but it, I didn't suspect that it was going to be to stay at Disney. I flew to New York for an audition. My very first Broadway audition was actually for the pre-Broadway national tour of Fiddler on the Roof. And I sang that song, and I got that job. It's sort of strange to me, but it really does feel fortuitous that it has been this common thread in my life and that it links back to that first experience with my mother. Uh, but that was it. I mean, I not that it was easy, but it was pretty uncomplicated for me. I got the first regional job I auditioned for, and I got my first the first Broadway show I auditioned for, so I moved to New York. I went on the road for a year and a half, and then the show came right back to Broadway, and I did that. And then I was in New York, and the show closed, and I sort of thought, well, that is actually when when my career officially started, I think. Up until that point, it had been a little accidental. I'd worked really hard, but I still didn't really have a sense of longevity or possibility. And when that show, which, uh, again, maybe not, but I always felt like those first couple of experiences were really just lucky. That show closed, and I thought, okay, well, now what? And I got cast in West Side Story out of Paper Mill Playhouse, and, the, and then I was cast as Smudge in Forever Plaid off Broadway. I thought, oh, okay, well, I can compete, but this is now a stock job and an off-Broadway job. Was that Broadway show just a one-time thing? And I went out to L.A. to do Star Search. And then I was cast in Joseph in Toronto, Canada. I had the freedom at that point to really move around, but I didn't know if that's what I wanted to do. And then I came back. I, I left that show. They wanted me to stay on. And I thought, no, I'm going to go for it. And I moved back to New York. And I had made a, dis I made a decision after that. Because I had now enough work under my belt. I thought, no, I can't compete. Let's, let's see what happens. And I took an audition for the revival of Guys and Dolls to replace Scott Wise. And I got that, and that was my second Broadway show. 
And then I pretty much worked on stuff on Broadway for 15 years and almost without stop. I was doing two and three year runs of different productions. It was a long process because it took me about four four shows on Broadway before I realized I had been typecast. I was really pigeonholed. And mm. Even though I saw myself as an actor, um, just by nature of personality, I kept getting cast as Gene Kelly. Mm -hmm. They were sort of like, but you can do that stuff that nobody can do, so, and people want to see you do it. And it took me saying no. Actually, I did an off-water production of The Coconuts, directed by Richard Zabelica, mm -hmm. and that was the first time anybody had seen me be really funny. And they were sort of like, ah, wait, this doesn't compute. And it confused a lot of people. They, they were like, well, if you can do too many things, then you probably aren't really great at anything. In some cases, like Kiss Me Kate, it was true, because no one could physically do what I was doing in that show. So... I understood why, but again, that was the kind of thing that really just stuck in people's minds. To this day, people will still talk to me about having seen a show live and that moment. And, and yet, the things that I'm the most proud of in my career are, is not that. It's the stuff that, you know, was either, like, Light in the Piazza was actually one of my favorite things, the proudest things I've ever done, because there was almost nothing on paper for that character. I never spoke English in the play, I only spoke Italian. Mm -hmm. And I got to create something that was that really filled in the world. It legitimized the sense of place and time. Again, that was the director in me. It just I enjoy that function, and I don't need it to be about me. It was after that that Chicago happened. That was at Encores for six performances or five performances. That's all it was supposed to be. But it was such a sensation. They transferred it to Broadway, and they offered me the cover for Billy Flynn, and I thought, I thought, okay, I'll do it. Because it, it did feel different, and it was covering a major lead for the second time for me, because I had covered Joe Hardy and Dan Yankees as well. And then they offered me the role, and they took over as Billy Flynn on Broadway, and that changed everything. The fastest dead end in show business is a male chorus dancer. I can count on one hand the men that have been able to transition out from being a male chorus dancer on Broadway. I'm proud, really proud, that I have been able to branch out again. And I think there's a generational shift happening now because a lot of the guys that I came up with, like Andy Blankenbuehler, who choreographed in the Heights and won a Tony Award for it, he was in that, com that chorus of West Side Story with me. Rob Ashford also was a male chorus dancer early in his career. And now there's there's a lot of people that have really sort of taken the reins back. And I'm proud to be one of them. When people say musical theater, they sort of think quality is synonymous with Broadway. It's not true. It is certainly the highest profile. It's thrilling. And I'm super proud and I love it. But there are a lot of limitations in the Broadway community as well. Sometimes doing a play like The Divic at the Great Lakes Theater Festival with Gerald Friedman and starring in it, you know, I mean, really having the integrity of the show hang on you a little bit was the greatest education and the most satisfying experience I've had in a play. But yes, in general, when you're working on Broadway for 19 years, doing 11 Broadway shows and third musicals and people want to keep you employed on Broadway, it's hard unless you say, I'm not going to do another musical, no matter what. To make room for that world as a straight play actor, it wasn't a goal of mine. And like I said, I don't have that same degree of drive and ambition that I see from a lot of my peers. But I worked as much, if not more, than almost all of them. I have to date done over 6,000 performances on Broadway, and that's a lot of fucking shows. Because even if you have worked on Broadway in a high-profile, super high-profile position, chances are you haven't done that many shows, because they're not usually super long run. I mean, unless you're Bernadette Peters, most of the people that have those giant reputations in the industry haven't done as many performances as people like me, who have done ensemble work, have done understudy work, have done leading work, you know. It's a very different breed, and I'm really proud of that. And it's not something that people perceive as what drives the industry, but artistically, it often does, not commercially. If you could say anything to your younger self, work hard and trust yourself. There's so much doubt when you're young. You think you can't possibly know, or that you don't have enough experience, or you don't have... And the truth is, you'll probably find in five years that that decision is no longer true for you. But when you're 20 years old, and you have something that you want to do that everyone's telling you you shouldn't do, or that it will never work, or you're not right for that, or it's a waste of time, or if there's a part of you that resists that, listen to it and do it. Because no matter what, even if it looks on paper like other people have been proven right, they have it because it's changed you. The act of choosing it has changed you. It's given you a different education. It's given you a different sense of confidence. And you do it again, and you do it again. And sometimes it happens the first time, and sometimes it happens the 20th time. But every single time you risk, every, sing every single time you take a chance, you grow. 
the people that say don't, or the people that are fearful for you, I would say don't be afraid. That's the thing I would say. That's the thing I would say probably in every category, don't be afraid.